I, um, I don't know how many of you enjoy watching medical dramas. I don't watch a lot of TV, but I used to, I used to really enjoy the program House. I don't know how many people have seen House, House MD. All right, so you know the way it works, right? Somebody shows up with a case that's very hard to diagnose, and so eventually it makes its way to him you know, after he said it's boring or whatever. So, so I want you to imagine a, a, a drama like that. So, so somebody is, is taken to the emergency room, and they say, you know, they, what's wrong? And you know, they're getting that history or whatever, and they say, he can't, he can't speak, he can't talk, he can't hear. Something has gone terribly wrong with him. We don't know what the problem is. And the doctor's going, well, that does sound pretty odd. I wonder, did, did he fall? Did he, did he hit his head or something like that? And, and they say, we don't know. He used to be able to, to, to walk and, and uh, I mean, uh, speak and, and hear and, and see things, but now he can't do any of those things. And so the doctor starts going, well, gee, I don't know. And he starts running tests and, and the tests all come up negative. All of his ideas, um, he can't figure out what's going on. So then, then you know, he says, okay, all right, I've, I've done the MRI, I've done all those things, um, and I still can't figure out. So he says, all right, I need to get a neurologist in here because maybe he's got some kind of a brain problem and the senses aren't working. So he gets the neurologist and the neurologist can't figure anything out. So they say, well, maybe he had some kind of emotional trauma and he's just kind of shut down. He's, he's suffering an emotional trauma. Let's get a psychologist in here. So on and on, they keep trying to figure out what's wrong with this guy and they can never figure it out. And finally, they give him the, the diagnosis. And some of you have had this diagnosis before. Um, it is that this is idiopathic, which is medicalese for I don't know. It, it literally means it has its own cause. And whatever that cause is, it's not one in my textbooks. So, um, so idiopathic, they say it's idiopathic. And then what they do is they, you know, maybe the friends are still there um, and they, they say, you know, take him home and keep him comfortable or whatever. Or maybe, you know, he gets discharged and he becomes a homeless person. And, and that's the situation in our reading today. But I want you to imagine just one more thing. So imagine you didn't see the show yourself, but you're at work or you know, you're talking to somebody in your neighborhood or something, and they tell you about this show. And so they've kind of piqued your interest. They're going, okay, and so now you're kind of curious, okay, well, what was the diagnosis? You know, I've seen House. What did the diagnosis turn out to be? And they say, instead, instead, of, instead of telling you that, they say, so then this guy heals him, and, and then something interesting happened. And you go, well, hold on a second. What was the diagnosis? What was the cure? And that's what Matthew does in our story today, that, that we, we can overlook it because we're so familiar with the stories in, in the New Testament. We're used to the idea, well, you know, people come to, to Jesus and he heals them and then something happens. And that's what's going on in our lesson today. We read that, we read that they, they brought this demon-possessed man who is blind and unable to speak and Jesus healed him so that he could do this thing. And now let me tell you something interesting. It's like Matthew is saying, you know, um, this, is, this, is, um, this is just what Jesus does all the time. And I'm not going to bore you with the details about how he, how he healed him or, or what was actually wrong with him. I'm just going to proceed right on to the interesting thing. It's like Matthew is actually tired of all the winning. That Jesus, you know, if you go back to chapters 8 and 9, he tells you all the things Jesus has done. Jesus has demonstrated complete authority over the physical and the metaphysical world. He's, he's healed lepers. He's, he's, um, he's healed people who had a, some kind of paralysis. He's, um, he's raised a... Uh, he, he, um, he brought a little girl back from the dead. He has calmed a storm. He has cast out demons. Jesus has shown complete authority over everything that has been presented to him. When the experts come to him and shrug, you know, when, when, he, when, when he's called in for the consult, Jesus is the one person who never says it's idiopathic. Jesus knows what to do about it. Jesus always solves the problem, whether it's in the physical world, some kind of an ailment that somebody has, or whether it's a metaphysical problem, that, that there's a demon or the, 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 there's a storm going on over the Sea of Galilee. Jesus has shown complete authority over everything that has been presented to him. And in this lesson, Matthew says, but something interesting happened. You know, I'm not going to rehearse all the good things Jesus has done. I'm going to tell you something interesting happened because Jesus says there's something he can't do. 
that so far you haven't heard a single thing that Jesus can't do, but there's something he can't do. There's something Jesus says can't be done. So what is that? Well, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, to um, take my time setting it up because, because it has to be, and, I, and we'll see why when I get there. So, so um, I'm going to go as quickly as I can to this, but, but basically the idea is that uh, they bring to Jesus this demon-possessed man. He's blind. He can't speak and so forth, and Jesus healed him. Okay, that's the part we've already covered. And the crowds are amazed, and they say, this man couldn't be the son of David, could he? he this, this man, Jesus, couldn't be the one that God promised, the the Savior that had been spoken of through all the prophets, somebody who would rescue um, uh, Israel, somebody who would fix what's broken in our world, that God would be faithful, He would keep His promise, and He would send this Messiah. So the crowds are saying, He couldn't be the son of David, could He? Because you can imagine, right? You've watched this thing. You've watched this, this demon get cast out, and you're thinking, well, if this guy can can overpower the legions of hell, then he should also be able to overpower the legions of Rome, right? You know, this is not a big stretch for somebody to imagine that. So they're thinking, this could be the guy who could actually rescue Israel from our foreign occupier. So maybe that's the reason they're thinking that. But when the, when the Pharisees uh, hear about this, the Pharisees, we've heard about them the, the, the last couple of weeks, we've been seeing how the Pharisees didn't like Jesus' position on the theological topics of the day. And you can catch up online if you weren't part of that conversation uh, uh, yet. But uh, basically, Jesus came down on the side of mercy. They came down on the side of the, the law. They said that the law has got some provisions for mercy, and that's as far as you can take it. And Jesus is saying, no, the law has got those exceptions to give you some ideas that they are pointers to the hearts of God, to, to God's heart. And so you should take those things and run with them. You should side with mercy when you're facing a question of law versus mercy. So they don't like that answer. And when Jesus leaves, they don't say, well, you know, there goes that guy. We disagreed with him. They pursue him and they hear the crowd saying, this guy could be the son of David. This guy could be that promised person. And so they, they intervene. They say, uh, when, when the Pharisees heard, they, uh, they said, this man, um, this man throws out demons only by the authority of Beelzebul, the ruler of the demons. So they say Beelzebul. Who is Beelzebul? Well, Jesus is about to tell us. Um, in, when, when I was growing up with older Bibles, it was Beelzebub. And um, uh, I did some reading this week and found out that that's actually from the Middle Ages. Uh, in Latin manuscripts, it's Beelzebub. I don't know how an L became a B. But somewhere along the way, somebody changed it, and that became kind of the standard all through the Middle Ages. But in the Greek manuscripts, the older Greek manuscripts, it's always Beelzebul. So now you know a little factoid. But, but he is the ruler of the demons, and Jesus is about to tell us who he is. Jesus says, um, um, every city or house torn apart by divisions. Um, uh, he says, uh, sorry, we missed a slide there. Because Jesus knew what they were thinking, he replied, every kingdom involved in civil war becomes a wasteland. Every city or house torn apart by divisions will collapse. If Satan, if Satan throws out Satan, there we go, okay, he is at war with himself. How then can his kingdom endure? So he says um, that that doesn't even make sense. It doesn't make sense that, that Satan, Beelzebul, would would go to war within his own kingdom. Why would, he, why, would, um, why would he destroy his own power, people who are operating out of his power, why would he undermine them and, and you know, defeat them? That, that, that doesn't even make sense. Why would, why would that happen? Why would, why would um, the, the kingdom of the demons be d divided by civil war? They should be united in their goal of being destructive. And I know and, you know, this, this is a problem for us, but let me, just, let me just get to the next verse and then we'll, we'll talk about it some. So um, that was the verse that's out of place. So, all right. So, um, so we might imagine, well, there, there may be some reason why, why uh, Satan might do that. You know, we might say, well, look, I don't know Satan, but I do know Jesus himself says that he is a liar and the father of lies. So maybe he's got some crafty trick up his sleeve. So that 
that the reason he's pretending to be at war with himself is to fool people. And, you know, maybe that's the case. But Jesus says, okay, well, if that's happening, let's, let's go with your theory. If that's happening, if I throw out demons by the authority of Beelzebul, then by whose authorities do your followers throw them out? You've got exorcists in your group too, and they're throwing out demons. So doesn't the same logic apply to them? Aren't they also doing what I just did? Um, and, and doesn't the same logic apply to them? And so he says, you know, you're basically saying that they're at work with Satan, and so they're going to judge you for that. You know, don't, don't do that. So, so Jesus says, says to them that what they're saying doesn't make sense. But I think for a lot of us today that this conversation is, you know, well, I don't even know what to make of it. I've never met a demon. You know, I don't know, I don't know what I think about demons. Um, that that we, we look down on people in the first century. We have this kind of 21st century mindset and we just assume, well, look, this guy had some kind of medical problem. It wasn't even a demon, um, you know, and if I had been able to watch it on, on my medical drama, they would have eventually figured out what the problem was. They wouldn't have called it idiopathic. They wouldn't have said that. And in the first century, they, hadn't, they, they didn't have the word idiopathic yet, or they, they had what, what little they knew about medicine was mostly wrong. And so instead of saying it was a physical problem, it was a demon. And I think, I think a lot of people in our, in our world today take that perspective. They say, well, look, this is not really a demon. It's just uh, ignorant people in the first century who didn't know any better. And I think that's the way a lot of people, a lot of people look at it. But, but the, the fact is Jesus took demons very seriously. And so if you're going to take Jesus seriously, you kind of have to take demons seriously. They're kind of part of the package. If Jesus takes them seriously, that's, that's a place where maybe you say, well, then I have to part company with Jesus. But that's what Jesus does. But, but beyond that, Jesus, there's a worldview here. Jesus is saying that, or, or the idea that Jesus is articulating is that our world is, is occupied territory, that God made the world good, and, and, and a foreign invader, a, um, a, an occupying force, has, has taken control of this world, and that that is Satan. So when he talks about the kingdom of Satan and the civil war and so forth, he's saying that there is this, this power that has established itself. And, you know, just watch the news. Watch what's going on in Afghanistan. We can imagine that kind of situation. The entire world has come under the power of this foreign occupying force. And so that's the worldview that Jesus is, is working in when he, when he says all this. So he's saying that, that um, this, the, the suffering in the world, all of the problems that we have in our world are not because God planned them from the beginning, but because, because they um, are the result of this occupying force. Um, now, Jesus was a master storyteller, right? We remember all of his stories about, you know, the, the son who went to a far country and the, the good Samaritan. Jesus was great at metaphors. He was always telling people that the kingdom of God is like a, a, a farmer who did this or a fisherman who did that. So, so maybe if it's helpful, you can say, okay, well, this is just a metaphor. After all, these people in the first century knew what it was to be under the boot of a foreign occupier. They, they would look at Rome and they'd say, okay, so there's a deeper spiritual reality here. I don't really understand it, but it's for, for my purposes, I can assume that it's like the Roman occupiers. And that metaphor is actually used in the, in the New Testament. It's used in the book of Re Revelation, except in the book of Revelation, it goes the other direction. In the book of Revelation, the, the idea is that Rome is, is a code for that un, unseen world. So if that's helpful, you can do that. Think of it as a metaphor. I don't think of it as a metaphor. I think it's very helpful to see the world as this occupied territory. And the Apostle Paul says the same thing. He says in his letter to the Ephesians, he says, we are not fighting against human enemies, but against rulers, authorities, forces of cosmic darkness and spiritual powers of, of evil in the heavens. So however you want to look at it, as, as this is a, a true statement about the reality that we don't see or if you want to say this is some metaphor that we have to further interpret to make sense of. Jesus is saying is working from this worldview. All right. So he tells people about the demons. 
And he says, okay, so what you've said, when you tell me that I'm casting out demons by the power of Beelzebul, then that doesn't make sense. And it also would apply to your own exorcist. But suppose instead you're wrong, right? We talked last week about being humble. Suppose you're wrong, then what? He says, if instead I throw out demons by the power of God's spirit, then God's kingdom has already overtaken you. That God did not leave you under the control of the foreign occupying power. That God has landed, that God has has, uh, sent in a a rescue party. And and Jesus is drawing on imagery here from from the the prophets. So he begins with this uh, image from uh, the prophet Ezekiel. The Lord God proclaims, I myself will search for my flock and seek them out. I will rescue my flock so they will never again be prey. I will even judge between the sheep. I will appoint for them a single shepherd and he will feed them. My My servant David will feed them. He will be their shepherd. Jesus says that thing that Ezekiel promised it's happening right now. If, in fact, I have, I have healed this man by the power of God's Spirit, then I'm doing exactly what Ezekiel told you would happen. So he says that. And then the next verse, Jesus changes to a different metaphor that they also would have been familiar with. He says, uh, Jesus says, Can people go into a house that belongs to a strong man and steal his possessions unless they first tie up the strong man? Then they can rob his house. And Jesus is drawing on the image from the prophet um, uh, Isaiah, who said, who said, can loot be taken from warriors? You know, in that culture, the first thing you do when you conquer somebody is you steal everything that's valuable and you take it back to your home country, your slaves and whatever else you want, you take that, right? He says, can a tyrant's captives escape? And the, the answer for Isaiah is, of course not, but God can do it. The Lord says, even the captives of warriors will be taken, even the tyrant's loot will, es- loot will escape. I myself will oppose those who oppose you, and I myself will save your children. Jesus is saying, you've got, these, you've got these images in the scriptures. You're familiar with this idea that God will save his people. He will save them not as some cataclysmic uh, upheaval in the world, but as this rescue party. I'm not going to wait until the end of this age. I'm going to start rescuing people right away. Jesus is saying the kingdom of God is already here. It's already overtaken you. That's the picture that Jesus has drawn here. So he says, he says, um, can a strong man go into a house that belongs, can, pe- can people go into a house that belongs to a strong man and steal his possessions unless they first tie up the strong man? Jesus is saying, those people who just called me the king of, uh, the son of David, the people who were wondering, am I the, the son of David? They were right, except that they thought too small. See, I'm not here to simply rescue Israel from Rome. I'm here to rescue the world from Satan. That they're right, but they thought too small. So Jesus is saying, yes, that's the situation. I am the one who can tie up the strong man. I can rob his house. And so he says, whoever isn't with me is against me, and whoever doesn't gather with me scatters. The question Jesus is asking is, okay, I've cut a hole in the wire. The brake's on. Are you coming? That's the question that Jesus is posing. Are you coming with me? I can spring you from the prison camp that the enemy has put you in. I can do that today, right now, not at the end of the age, but today. Are you coming? That's the question that Jesus is asking. And that's a lot of lead up. I was debating whether this should be two separate messages, but I wanted to have it in your mind. I wanted you to have it echoing as you heard the next part. And so I decided to put these two pieces together because finally Jesus says the thing he can't do, the thing that cannot be done, the thing that Jesus who has calmed storms and and, uh, brought children back from the dead, he's healed lepers, he's healed paralyzed people. Jesus can do everything except this. And now finally we come to it. What is it? Jesus says, Therefore I tell you, people will be forgiven for every sin and insult to God, but insulting the Holy Spirit won't be forgiven. And whoever speaks a word against the human one, Jesus, will be forgiven. But whoever speaks against the Holy Spirit won't be forgiven, not in this age or in the age that is coming. Jesus is talking, our our translation says insulting 
the traditional language is blasphemy. Blasphemy against the Holy Spirit. And some of you have heard that. Some of you have actually heard it used against people. And that's the problem with this verse. The, the, there was a Swiss um, scholar named Ulrich um, Luz. He just died a couple of years ago. And he wrote a massive commentary where he assembled all the, the scholarly work on the, the Gospel of Matthew and, and kind of the long history of interpretation over the last 2,000 years. And he said this. He said, out of this text, no fruits of love has arisen. And he asks the reader, people who are reading this book that he put together, this big scholarly volume, he said, can exegesis, can our interpretation, no matter how careful or, or accurate, can it protect our saying from its own history of interpretation? He says that the problem is this verse has been misused for so long, he doubted whether anybody could rescue it. And, and you can understand why that would be. People like me, uh, beginning as early as the, the mid-100s, people like me, people who stood up in the front of the church, somebody says, wait, I'm not sure that we should do that, or I'm not sure you're right about that passage of Scripture. They, they basically challenge that person, and the leader says, you are blaspheming the Holy Spirit. Instead of saying, well, let's talk about it, because maybe I got it wrong. Let's have that conversation. They say, no, you're not just a sinner. You're not just a bad person, but you have blasphemed the Holy Spirit because I couldn't possibly say anything that wasn't the work of the Holy Spirit, right? So people have been misusing this verse for nearly 2,000 years. But they haven't all done that. They haven't all done that. So um, I want to I wanna point out some things before, before we look at this. The first thing is, notice Jesus says, forgiven for every sin. So if you're thinking put aside for a moment blasphemy against the Holy Spirit. Just start with the idea, that thing, that thing that you don't tell anybody about, the thing that, that you regret, the, the thing you wish had never happened, you know, and you're just hoping it never comes back to haunt you. Nobody knows about it except you. You can be forgiven for that. This is an amazing promise. Jesus makes the amazing promise. And unfortunately, because of the second half of this verse, people don't hear that part. So the first thing is Jesus is saying that the forgiveness of God is so wide you cannot fathom it, that there is nothing that cannot be forgiven except the one thing. The other thing to be aware of is we need to realize this, this statement, the, the, the thing Jesus says about the blasphemy against the Holy Spirit happens in a context. He has just been, people have just accused him of doing his saving work through the power of Beelzebub. That people have demonized him. And whatever else the blasphemy against the Holy Spirit means, it tells us we should, like the Pharisees, be very careful about demonizing people. There's a, there's a saying on the internet, you should, you should never um, attribute to malice what can be explained by stupidity. That there's just this simple idea, you disagree with somebody on the internet, I know that never happens, right? <laughs> right? But they're wrong. And instead of jumping to the conclusion they are an evil person with, with bad motives, you should start by the assumption that they are stupid or they are mistaken or they don't have all the facts. That, that there are gentler, kinder ways of looking at their problem than immediately saying they're an evil person and they're out to cause you harm. That, that that's just common sense. So Jesus is telling these people, if nothing else, even if we wind up and still being puzzled about the blasphemy against the Holy Spirit, there's a, there's a huge lesson here, which is don't demonize people. That, that you can, even, even if you say, well, that thing they did was just utterly evil, you can start like the Apostle Paul and say, our enemies are not flesh and blood. Yes, what they did was unspeakably evil and there is no excuse for it. But ultimately, they did so because this is occupied territory and that they are under oppression that I cannot imagine, that there is a spiritual force that is acting on them and that that person, however evil they have been to me, is not a demon. There is a demon behind them, causing them to do the things they do. It doesn't excuse them, but it helps us to appreciate that they aren't demons. So we need to be careful about demonizing people. 
Now, I said, I, I quoted uh, 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 Dr. Luz, who said that no good can come from this passage. But that has not always been the case. There have been, during those past 2,000 years, there's been people who said actually some good things have come from this. So Matthew Henry, who wrote in the 1700s, he was a, um, a scholar in the 1700s, he said, those who fear they have committed this sin give a good sign that they have not. That, that the very act of worrying about whether or not I might have committed this sin, the, the blasphemy against the Holy Spirit, is a sign that I haven't done it. And uh, no less an authority than St. Augustine said that this sin is persistent and ongoing impenitence that continues absolutely to resist the Holy Spirit. It is to say that I am in a hole. I'm aware that I'm in a hole. I hear somebody up above saying, turn around, quit digging. And I say, no. To say, to say, no, I'm going to keep digging. I'm going to, in fact, I'm going to dig faster. It's, you're driving along and your GPS says, says you missed the turn and it recalculates the route and it says, it says, you know, take the next left and, you know, do this thing. And you're saying no and you step on the gas. That is what it is. It is, is continuing and on, persistent and ongoing impenitence that continues absolutely to resist the Holy Spirit. The reason that this sin is not forgivable isn't because God can't forgive a sin. It's because forgiveness is rejected. It is the rejection of forgiveness. Jesus is saying that's the one danger. That the one danger is that you hear the Holy Spirit. You see evidence of Jesus working in the world right in front of you. And you say, no, I don't want that. Thank you very much, but I've got my own plan. That is the one sin that cannot be forgiven. I mentioned the internet. Um, there's, a, there's a meme, I've seen it a lot lately, I, probably because of current events, but it shows a little dog, maybe some of you have seen it, a dog is sitting in a room and there's flames all around it and the dog says, this is fine. And it's that, it's, it's, it's the refusal to acknowledge, no, actually something is very, very wrong here, that, that the situation I'm in needs to be fixed. It's, it's, that, it's, that, it's that unwillingness to accept the, the witness of the Scripture, uh, the witness of the Holy Spirit, telling us there's not just, not just the situation is bad, but there is a solution. So the picture here is that Jesus has cut a hole in the wire. Jesus has made our escape possible. Jesus says, I am that guy that Isaiah told you about. I'm the guy who could, who's broken into the home and is stealing the loot from the strong man. He says, I'm that guy. Are you coming? He says, I have cut a hole in the wire. This is your opportunity to escape. And if you say, no, I like it here. There's no forgiveness. That, 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 that there is simply no way of forgiving something if you reject the escape that is offered. Now, because there have been so many, so much damage done with this verse, I will offer one more possibility of, of what, um, what it might mean. If you notice, um, Jesus, says, Jesus says, whoever speaks a word um, uh, against the Holy Spirit won't be forgiven, not in this age or in the age that is coming. Some interpreters, uh, this is not a majority opinion, I think not many as a percentage, um, uh, uh, would, would hold with this idea, but some interpreters have said, even when Jesus returns in glory, when, when the, the sky is rolled up like a, a scroll and everything is revealed, when, when Jesus is no longer raiding people and cutting through the wire to help them escape, Jesus will actually still give them one more opportunity to say, to say, all right, I see now the error of my ways. I was wrong. I'm finally going to listen to the GPS say, turn around. So that is one possibility. And I, I don't know if it's true, um, but since this verse has been misused so often, I'm going to, I'm going to at least give you the possibility. Let's be misusing it. If we are misusing it, let's err on the side of too, too much mercy and too much grace. But that raises the question. If you're in the prison camp, if you're being oppressed, 
And Jesus says, I've cut a hole in the wire. Are you coming? Why wait? Jesus is saying his salvation is available now. Not the wholesale salvation that will be available someday, but the retail salvation, the plundering the loot of a strong man. If you have, if you have regrets, if you have loneliness, if you have fear and anxiety, if there are any way that the spiritual forces of the unseen realms is oppressing you, if you struggle with, with sobriety or fidelity or, or honesty or, or any other virtue that you would like to be better at practicing, but you don't, that it's too hard for you, Jesus is saying, I can help. I've cut a hole in the wire and you can escape right now. Why would you wait? Why would you wait to the end if that's available to you right now? Jesus is saying, I've cut a hole in the wire. Will you come with me? To follow Jesus is to follow Jesus out of bondage. Let's pray. Gracious God, um, you know how much damage this teaching has done. How many people have misrepresented it for their own selfish ends or because they are prideful like these religious experts in the story. Lord, we pray for everybody who has been harmed by this verse. We know, O oh God, that we all make mistakes, but this one in particular removes hope from people. So help us, Lord, never to make the mistake of casting doubt on Jesus' ability to save. Lord, we pray that you would help us to remember that whatever sins we have, whatever mistakes we've made, um, whatever virtues we failed to do, that everything can be forgiven. The only sin that cannot be forgiven is rejecting the forgiveness when it is offered, Lord. We pray that you would help us to cling to that truth and follow Jesus out through the wire. In his holy name we pray. Amen.